know if there's any opportunity for any kind of extra credit or anything for that's what i'm trying to to conjure up i'm trying to make it where we can improve those previous test scores uh but i'm also trying to make it where it teaches you some of the things that students aren't getting like uh i've been trying to make up a sort of a socratic method of asking questions regarding gauss's law and ampere's law so that we could better understand how to apply those uh it's taken me a while to do it but if i don't get it done by this week then uh I'm just going to do like you said and, and just say redo the test and uh, do it in its entirety, getting the right answers. And by the way, I did find out my students reported to me that they are able to go using the lockdown browser. They can actually go into the grade book and click on their graded exam and see it even now. Okay. So hopefully that still works. Okay. Because I, I do want you students to go in and, and take a photograph of every problem on the pass face-to-face tests and then make sure you can work those uh so every one of them not just the ones you got wrong make sure you can work them and then later i might happen to uh ask y'all all to turn that in neatly and you'll have already had it done if you if you did that so it's it's good practice to do period you, you should always take your old tests and make sure you can redo every problem like it and even look for some of the ones that stumped you so that you can get a little bit more experience but as a bare minimum definitely work those Thank you. Okay. And that was to everybody, not just Carter, but yeah. All right. Well, it looks like time is up and we've got a whole four students in the class. So this is like busting at the seams. No, no, the class is supposed to be bigger than this. We're supposed to have like eight or nine, but do it looks like actually maybe I already have, but I was going to say to go ahead and chat me your first and last name. And here comes the yawning. Oh, yep. There's another person. So yeah, uh, make sure you... Make sure you chat me your first and last name so I have you for attendance. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I was just telling Carter and Danielle and uh, Tanika was in here as well, uh, as well as Gabrie Gabrielle. But anyways, uh, I am shooting for you guys having a test, uh, a face-to-face -face test and an online test just before we leave again. That's what I'm really trying. But uh, the face-to-face -face test, what I'm going to do is I'll make sure you get it by Monday, and then you'll have at least until Tuesday of next week, or the week after Thanksgiving, you'll have at least till Tuesday of that time to do that face-to-face -face one at a proctoring facility. And the online one, I'm going to leave it the same way, uh, but the main thing is you'd be really smart to do the online test first. Uh, you're allowed up to, usually I'll let you have three attempts and I only count your highest. So do that one first. Get some confidence and then do the face-to-face -face one as soon as you can schedule it. And like I said, I'm not going to force it where someone has to do it over the break. That's why I'm saying, okay, we're going to have off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to make it available Monday uh, of next week and it'll be available at least through all of Tuesday of next week or the week after Thanksgiving, I should say. So that's what we're doing with that. So you, sh uh, in fact, I already made the practice test up. I don't know if it's published yet, but it's, it's made. I, I just have to turn it on and check it, make sure it's working and it'll be on our Canvas site tonight. Additionally, uh, I'm trying to knock out chapter 25 in basically counting for today's class. So I'm going to work a good number of problems from chapter 25 and later, I'm going to do a video of the remaining examples that I wanted to do for you. And there, those will just be independent examples that I'll do and I'll post online. And when I do, I'll put a link to them in in our Canvas course, but I'll also email you all to let you know it's there. Then if, you know, hopefully I'll have it done by Thursday. If you have any questions on it, you can ask me again Thursday. Uh, but if you don't have any questions on it, uh, then... Uh, you might wait till the, the following week and you can still have another chance to ask me. So I don't want it to seem like it, you're just getting an online class, but it's sort of more like a flipped class where I'm showing you some problems on a video and then you can come back and solve other problems and ask me other questions. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, anybody have any questions before we get started? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you before I forget, because I will start just talking and writing in my pad for no reason, because ain't nobody looking. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my iPad screen with you guys. And that should come up any second now. 
and I'm trying to make this a little neater and I'm trying to be more uh, prepared, as you can tell. I'm basically typing out the examples so we'll have the words of the questions right there, not just referring back and forth to the book and that sort of stuff. So let's get started with this. Last time when we met, by the way, and I can pull that up real quick. Last time when we met, we started chapter 25 and I talked about electric current and I introduced some very specific equations. You see V terminal is equal to the EMF of the battery minus IR. <sighs> where little r is the internal resistance of the battery. I had Ohm's law, V equals I R. I had resistance R is equal to rho L over A. I didn't actually get to the temperature version uh, of how the resistance changes with temperature, but I'll be showing you that in a few. And I, yeah, I guess the rest of this was just questions I had. So anyways, we're getting uh, back to that. And we're going to start with example 25.1. You'll notice that these are somewhat related to the problems that the textbook has, but they are uh, somewhat different as well, so that it gives you more examples, but also very similar examples. So it's not, I don't want them to be so distinctly different that are, they're much harder or much easier than the ones in the book. So let's start with this guy right here. It says a constant current of five amps exists in a wire for five minutes how much total charge passes by a given point during those five minutes and how many electrons would it take to reach that charge so <sighs> what we're saying here is i want you to use your understanding of uh of current to compute how much charge will be passing by a single point in a wire if the wire is carrying a current of five amps for five whole minutes so I'm going to write I is equal to 5.00 amps. I want to remind you guys that, of course, amps are coulombs per second. I want to uh, remind you that delta T is equal to 5.00 minutes. And I want to remind you that I is equal to delta Q over delta t at least on average so maybe we'll say like that but in this case the current is actually a constant current so the average should be just good enough uh another thing we need to know is the charge on a single electron because they are asking us how many electrons would it take to make that charge this symbol e is the universal symbol for the charge of the electron but it's normally listed as positive so technically speaking it's really the charge of the proton but it's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs so we're going to start with part a and we know i is equal to delta q over delta t and we want to know delta q so delta q is i times delta t now i is 5.00 coulombs per second. Notice I went ahead and wrote the amps as coulombs per second. So we can more easily see that this result will come out in coulombs. Now, I also want to write the time right here. That's 5.00 minutes. But you can see that that minute will not cancel out with the second in the denominator. So as I often do with unit conversions, I'll put that over one. I'll put this multiplied by a symbol. I'll put another fraction bar over here. And now I got to realize that I want to cancel out the minutes. So I'll have to put minutes on the bottom. And then I want seconds to be the result. So I have to put seconds on top. And what I know is that one minute is 60 seconds. And it's actually like 60 with an infinite number of decimal places. So you don't have to worry about sig figs. Uh, messing you up in that case uh, let me clean that up a little bit but anyways it's going to be 60.0 with a bar over it uh, seconds and then that is well that was kind of an ugly parenthesis but there's the parenthesis so now if I go ahead and do this I'm going to say 5 times 5 times 60 and of course that's 300 seconds times 5 so that gives me 1500 
coulombs. Now, technically speaking, we only had three sig figs, so this last zero is not a sig fig, and that's what delta Q is. So I'm going to go ahead and box this off. That's the answer for part A. Anybody have any questions on that? Now, one thing I, I advise people to do is sometimes your your book or me will ask you questions that seem like there's not really an equation for. When that happens, that's often a case where you've got to use unit or you have to use sort of the units to make sense of it. So like, for instance, in part B here, it says, how many electrons would it take to reach that charge? What I know is I have a 1,500 coulombs. And what I also know is I know the charge of the electron in coulombs, but here's a nice little tip. When you're doing this type of thing and trying to figure out an equation, uh, it's nice to sort of customize the unit. So for instance, if you're using Avogadro's number and you're talking about the number of electrons uh, in a chunk of copper, for instance, then we know copper usually spares one electron per atom. So basically the number of atoms, which is Avogadro's number in a mole of copper, again, like I said, is Avogadro's number. That number also happens to be the number of electrons. So if you look up Avogadro's number, they'd say 6.022 times or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and they'll call the units reciprocal moles, like moles to the negative one. I would customize that one and call that unit uh, electrons per mole. Or if you were talking about just the atoms, you could say copper atoms per mole. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to customize the units of the electron charge as coulombs per electron. Okay. Now, when you go along this little path where you're trying to use unit analysis to figure out how you could possibly figure out the number of charges, hopefully it automatically comes clear to you. Uh, I'm going to give you some ways of thinking about it, but if it doesn't, there's this sort of brute force way you can do that doesn't require you to be smart. It just requires you to be uh, knowledgeable about the process so we've got a number that's 1500 coulombs and we've got another number that we know we got to use which is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs per electron so when you have two numbers like that there's a limited number of math things you can do to them so in principle two numbers could be added but you see here the 1500 coulombs and the e equals 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs per electron there's innately different especially since i customized that unit so you can't really add them and you can't subtract them either Okay, you sort of can, and I'll explain that in a second. But anyways, you sort of can, and like I said, I'll explain that. But another thing you could do is you could multiply them. Well, if you multiplied them, you'd get uh, coulombs squared per electron, so that doesn't help. You could also divide them. You could divide E by, uh, by the 1,500 coulombs, and then you'd get an answer where the coulombs would cancel out, and you'd get reciprocal electrons as the answer units and that doesn't make any sense but you could try dividing the other way in which case you take 1500 coulombs and divide that by e and the coulombs in the 1500 would cancel out with the coulomb in the numerator of e and the denominator of e would go to the top so i'd end up getting uh basically the number of electrons would be the final unit so that's the way we're actually going to do it and I, again i'll tell you another way in a second but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a uh, number of E minuses. And I'm going to say that's 1,500 coulombs divided by 1.6. And since we're only using like two or three sig figs, there's not much use in going further than 1.60 with, I mean, with the, charge of the electron so i'm just going to leave the two off it doesn't matter you could put the two in there you could not i'm just going to write it this way times 10 to the negative 19th and now the units are coulombs per electron so if you take this 1500 and divide it by 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 you get 9.3 75 
times 10 to the 21. And notice the units of coulombs cancel out, and all we're left with is E minuses. So that was actually what we were shooting for, and that is the answer. Now, we only had three sig figs, so technically uh, I shouldn't have that five there. But we can say it's roughly 9.38 times 10 to the 21st uh, electrons. Now, I do want to say something about uh, a way you can more in intelligently know what you're going to do there. Uh, if you're actually trying to look for like or count something like counting the number of electrons, you could imagine taking 1500 electrons like you have here, or excuse me, 1500 coulombs of charge like you have here, and then saying, okay, I'm going to take from that 15, I'm going to subtract 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Now, that would take a long time, but the point is you can do it. So you could say 1500 coulombs minus of course you'd have to write it out to 1500 coulombs with uh basically 20 decimal places after it and assume they're all zero but in principle you could subtract the 1.602 times into the negative 19th because the one would literally be on the uh 18th decimal place so you'd subtract the 1602 from the 18th decimal and beyond and then you do it again, then you do it again, then you do it again. Whenever you find yourself doing that, where you're repeatedly removing uh, a charge or a quantity from something, then that's sort of like repeated subtraction. And the very definition of repeated subtraction is division. So that's another way of thinking about this. I just think, okay, well, if, if I really had this stuff laid out in front of me as physical objects, I would take those 1500 coulombs and I'd write it out to, you know, 24 decimal places or something like that. And I'd take 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th, which is literally 0 0.18 zeros followed by 1602. I'd pull that out of the 1500. That's one electron. I pull it out again. That's another electron. Keep in count. Pull it out again. That's another electron. So what I'm seeing when I try to do that is repeated subtraction. And that's what division is, is repeated subtraction. Similarly, if you have something where you're trying to add something in to build up to some quantity, repeated addition means multiplication. So uh, that's those are two nice little tricks that you can use when you're doing uh, what a lot of people nowadays call, uh, nowadays call story problems. I don't know how they became that. They're the word problems, but <laughs> a lot of people like it. And guess what? If I've got people that didn't know words like uh, word problems and stuff like that, and now all of a sudden they're doing word problems and calling them story problems, I'm tickled that they're calling them story problems because they're doing friggin' physics. Okay? So everybody get that? Not the whole physics <laughs> speaking diatribe, but the, the main part of the problem. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, just to remind you, uh, we asked about electrons because we know fundamentally that it's actually electrons moving, but the electrons move as if they're running from the negative terminal of batteries towards the positive terminal. And uh, what we do is we pretend positive particles are going the opposite way and those positive particles going the opposite way is what we call conventional current so i just want to remind you that in reality it's it is electrons that's why we divided it by electrons uh we didn't have to worry about the sign because the number divided by it whether it's positive or negative still gives you the number of electrons so any questions on that <laughs> i got sidetracked writing my solution and wrote the word subject instead of solution Oh, Lord. I'm sure I got a tumor or something. It's, it's just crazy. All right, let's look at example 25-2. Uh, this is very much like a conceptual example that your book did. Uh, but the specific thing is I wanted to talk to you a little bit about connecting things in circuits and, and making sense of, of how they're connected so that you'll have some understanding. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about a, uh actual light bulb. So if you look at a light bulb... Uh, it has a part like this that you screw into the receptacle, right? And that actually has like some threads that go around here and then another thread that comes around here and then another thread 
that comes around here like this. Okay, so those threads are something that's really real, but they actually partake of something because it turns out that if you were to look inside, you would see that there's basically a solder spot of wire connected to the actual uh, threads of the light bulb. Now, the bulb itself, I'm going to make it a weird shape just so it fits in the space. Uh, but the bulb itself is basically just has uh, maybe a little bit of air in it, but in general, you try to get rid of any possible contaminants. Uh, so you suck out most of the stuff, and, and then you just run this little wire here, and that wire is usually like tungsten or something, and it'll just curl a bunch of times, and then it comes down here, and this is another neat part. It completely bypasses the threads, but on the bottom... What you'll notice is like there's a shiny, usually a shiny black thing in the center of the threads that's, that separates the brass or whatever the metal is that the threads are made of. There's usually something shiny between that metal and then there's some dull gray metal at the bottom. And that dull gray metal is that right there, that itty bitty tip that I'm talking about. That dull gray is usually uh, lead. And it's because, uh, or it's at least got some lead in it, because you can actually just hold your soldering iron, soldering iron up to it, and it'll melt. And then you just stick sort of your wire, which has been pre-wetted with a little solder. You can uh, basically just dip that solder, uh, soldered in right into that pool of lead after you heat it up, and that's how you connect it. So notice one wire of the filament is connected to the actual threads, and the other wire is connected to the actual base of the plug so when we're talking about connecting a double a battery to a light bulb to do it to be honest with you a light bulb uh, now this is different for leds some leds have a very specific direction they have to go but uh with a regular light bulb the direction of the current doesn't matter in fact you can plug it into ac and that's pretty much what you do so what i'm going to do is i'm going to draw a double a battery now so the top of the AA battery has this little positive terminal, okay? And then that positive terminal is in the middle of the top of the cylindrical battery. So the battery will come way down like this. And this side down here is the negative terminal. And this side up here is the positive terminal. And it really doesn't matter for the light bulb. But what I can do now is I need to imagine particles coming out of this battery. And I'm going to tell you, they're not necessarily coming out of the battery. Uh, in fact, uh, in a, like in our conceptual physics class, we take time to teach you that uh, unlike a water hose, where you buy a water hose from a hardware store, you've got to go home and then provide your own water to blow through the hose. Whereas when you go buy a bunch of copper wire, you don't have to supply your own charges. They're already built into the copper wire. So in some sense a good fraction of the uh, movement of charges is not due to actual charges leaving the, the positive terminal of the battery. It's just uh, free charges in the wire uh, being compelled to move because the electric field established in the wire as a result of the positive end of the battery and the negative end of the battery. But you need both of those ends. So when we go to connect something to a power source like a battery or a power supply or a light receptacle, we need to think, okay, what area is, are we pretending that positive charges are coming out of? And then what does it need to go through? And then where are the positive charges supposed to go back into the battery if they were really leaving and, and stuff like that? So that's what you want to think when you go to connect a circuit. So in this case, I know for a fact that one terminal of this light bulb is in fact the very bottom. So I can just choose to take that little terminal right there, the one that's on the bottom of the light bulb, and I'm going to say that's it right there. And the light bulb's a lot smaller than it was drawn before because obviously I can't fit as much stuff. Okay, but there's your light bulb right there. 
And of course, we just learned that one of these wires comes out here, does this sort of thing, and comes back down here to that. So I've got the positive connected, but now I need a return path. So right now I can see it's it's almost like I can imagine little positive particles going up here, going through that little terminal, going through that little bottom. Now they're running up this wire, going around those little curls, and now they need to come back out and they run into the threads. So what I can do at this point is connect the threads with a wire like this and just connect that at the bottom of the battery. So now I've got a path. I can see the path actually goes right through the bottom terminal of the light bulb, goes through the filament, and then comes and touches the threads, at which point this blue wire runs from the threads to the bottom a negative terminal of the battery. Okay? So that's a way you can actually connect it. Your book does various pictures of a, a light bulb on a battery and uh, using a wire or two. And, and it's good for you to look at those. So definitely make sure you look at them. But I just wanted you to have some idea of how to actually connect these sort of things. And, and I'm sure you're getting this in lab anyways. But anybody have any questions on that one? Okay. Example 25.3, it says, is 100 amp hours a unit of current? time energy charge or what and the second part what would 100 amp hours be in si base units anybody know off the top of your head or can figure out by looking at it what the unit of an amp hour is nobody well remember an amp is a coulomb per second Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, the hour is a unit of time. So one hour is actually equal to 60 minutes. And technically, that is 60 with a line over the zero. So it goes on forever minutes. But that's also 3,600 seconds. So you can see that clearly, uh, since this has a amp, which is a Coulomb second, and an hour, which is equivalent to a second, and that they're multiplied, notice the little dot, then we realize that an amp multiplied by an hour should give us units of, anybody want to try to say now? Well, it would if you don't convert the hours to seconds. Well, if you convert the hours to seconds, then it's just coulombs, right? Because exactly. the hour becomes seconds, and the seconds would cancel. Yep, that's exactly right. And uh, so, one amp hour is a unit of charge. Have you guys been like to Target or Walmart or wherever, or any you know local store, for instance, some small family store, and seen the unit of an amp hour anywhere? I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't, but I bet you will now. Okay. Uh, I usually see it in the checkout line, but I also see it in the electronic section. But I see it in the checkout line at Walmart, and it's those new devices that you can buy, and you plug them in, and they get charged up, and then you carry them around with you. And at any time your battery of your phone is dead, you can just plug it into that, and it's a portable charger. If you look at those, you'll notice they have things like 100,000 amp hours or 10,000 amp hours. So that's what the unit is. It's literally a unit of charge, and you can sort of uh, think of it like it's putting charges back into the battery from you know using so many charges that we just ran out of them. So you can sort of picture the battery as like it's a little cup full of charges. And uh, as you use it, you don't always get the same number of charges back that you put out which is obviously a violation of conservation of charge. But the main thing is I'm telling you as that as a model. So we see the unit is uh, charge. And now I can say part two of the question, 
they wanted to know uh, what would what amp hour be in SI base units. So I'm going to say 1.0 amps times hours is equal to 1.0 coulombs per second times 3,600 seconds. So you can see that the seconds and the seconds cancel out and you get, in fact, 3,600 coulombs. So that's what one amp hour is. It's 3,600 coulombs. Any questions on that? So just an amp hour, notice that that's a, that's 3,600 coulombs. And when we did the five amps for five minutes, we only got what, 1,500? So this is twice as many coulombs in one amp hour as you get for five minutes in a uh uh in in a five amp current so kind of neat anybody have any questions on that all right we'll move along again a flashlight uses a double a battery which has a nominal voltage of 1.50 volts and draws 250 milliamps from it what is the resistance of the bulb that's part a Part B, how much current would the battery provide if it was weakened to produce only 1.1 volts? And then it asks you to assume that the resistance will be the same as it was in part A. Okay, so that's not always the case if you're dealing with, uh, for instance, light bulbs. Uh, if you actually have a light bulb, obviously the uh, resistance is always dependent on temperature. So if you run current through it, then it's probably going to get a little hotter and that's going to make the resistance go a little higher. And therefore, if you do it once with the 1.50 volts, that might set the current, uh, the resistance. But if you wait a little while, the resistance might come down again some more because it got cooled off again so weird stuff like that but let's go ahead and start uh what we're looking for here is in part a we're wanting to know specifically uh what is the resistance of the bulb so what we're using here is the fact that it has a voltage v equal to 1.50 volts and that we have a current i equal to 250 milliamps. And we also know that there's a law called Ohm's law that says V is equal to I times R. So that might come in handy. And then later we're gonna use V equals 1.1 volts. Uh, so we'll deal with that when we get there. So I, I suspect y'all have already thought of a way to solve this. I hope you have. Uh, what we're going to do is take Ohm's law, V equals IR. I would normally solve this for R and then plug the numbers in, but I know most of my students do it entirely differently, so I'm going to try to do a little bit more of this. So I'm going to say the voltage is 1.50 volts, and the current is, in this case, you can actually, when we get start getting into uh, circuits and stuff like that. That's an area where we often keep our millis and kilos and micros and nanos uh, on them uh, because we've worked with it so much that we've learned uh, neat little tricks. Like for instance, if you divide a base unit by a milli, that's a milli in the denominator, it becomes a kilo in the numerator. So that's a kind of neat thing. But anyways, that that's one thing we can do. So I can write this as 250 milliamps times R like that. That's what Ohm's law tells me. So now I can take uh, 150, or excuse me, 1.50 and divide it by 250. And when you do that, you get this. So I'm going to write it out just so you can see what the unit becomes but it's 1.50 volts over 250 milliamps. So I got to turn my calculator on evidently. 1.5 divided by 250 is equal to 0 0.006. I'm going to assume we have three sig figs here, so that'll be 600. And then this one would be a non-sig fig. Now, as I told you, I divided a base unit, a kilo, or excuse me, a volt, which doesn't have any prefix on it. So I, I divided a base unit by a milliamp. 
a volt divided by amp is an ohm, but dividing by a milli is a kilo ohm. So what we have here is 0 0.006 kilo ohms, which we can move the decimal three places to the right. One, two, three. And that would make it just a regular ohm. So now we can say that R is equal to 6.00 ohms. And that's the question they asked us for part A. Now you could have done, I'll say note, R equals 1.50 volts over 0 0.250 amps gives me 150, or excuse me, 1.5 divided by 0 0.25 gives me 0.25. Okay, so you can still do it that other way. You don't have to use the milli, but just uh, if you want to, try try it sometime, okay? All right, so now let's look at part B. It says, how much current would the battery provide if it was weakened to produce only 1.1 volts? You know, as time goes by, the actual terminal voltage of a battery does decrease. Remember, I told you they normally model that by putting an internal resistance in it, and then you sort of think of that internal resistance as if it grows over time. And therefore, whenever you just test the battery with a multimeter or a voltmeter of some sort, it doesn't really draw an appreciable amount of current, so it pretty much just reads the whole 1.72 or whatever it started with initially. But over time, even that starts to go down. But when you take the 1.72 that it reads when you first get it out of the box, if you take that and connect it to, say, a light bulb, what you'll find is if you measure the terminal voltage when it's drawing current through it, it's normally a little lower than the 1.72 it was. And sometimes it'll drop as low as uh, 1.5. So it's good to think about it being 1.5 and what happens when it goes a little bit below. So that's what we're doing here in Part B. So in Part B, they're asking how much current would the battery provide but this time they're giving us the voltage and we're supposed to use the same current we had, or excuse me, the same resistance we had. So I'm going to say V equals IR gives me 1.1 volts is equal to I times 6.00 amp. Uh, excuse me, I said amps. What a goober. Uh, I was getting ready to do this and that's probably what screwed me up. So I'm going to take 1.1 and divide it by 6 and that gives me 0 0.183 now clearly I only have two sig figs here so it might have been smarter to use two sig figs on the previous part too but anyways this is 0 0.1833 amps and these last two numbers are not significant. You could also call this 183.3 uh, milliamps. So you can tell now that the actual uh, current does markedly change when the batteries drop from 1.5 to 1.1. We went from 250 milliamps to uh, basically 180. So it's not very much. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. Let's try another. This is uh, another sort of conceptual example. Uh, it doesn't really need the whole page necessarily. But anyways, we put it there. So consider the diagram of a part of a circuit shown below. So y'all see the little resistor and wire and the A and the B. Obviously, the current's going to the right, uh, and it, the current is I. It says, what, if anything, can we conclude about the voltage at point A, about how the voltage at point A compares to the voltage at point B? And B how is the current at A related to the current at B? So can anybody tell me, do we know anything about the voltage at A versus the voltage at B? So 
So here's the deal. Current. Conventional. Current, conventional current, that is. Uh, travels from high voltage oops voltage to low voltage in fact where there is oops no change in voltage current will not flow So, in other words, like we did in that uh, one of the first labs we did when we were doing the actual mapping of the electric field, we basically put a probe down at one little dot on the carbon paper, and then we took the other probe and tried to move it until we found a spot where the galvanometer read zero. When the galvanometer read zero, that meant those two spots had the exact same voltage, and that meant that they were part of what we would call a equal potential surface or an equal potential line. So given this information, we know that the voltage uh, has to be, or the current has to flow from high voltage to low voltage. Therefore, V at A must be greater than V at B. So that's what we know about that is that, in fact, the voltage at the A side is higher than the voltage at the B side. Now, what about uh, part B? Does anybody have any idea about that? It says, how is the current at A related to the current at B? Is it the same? Exactly. Very much. Good job, Tanika. Don't hear your voice uh, that often, so I'm glad I heard it in. Uh, I always want uh, people to chip in as much as they can, so that's cool. What we got going on here is uh, imagine a certain number of charges coming along that one little wire to point A. If, let's say, a billion uh, electrons flies by in that A, uh, at that point A, in one second, if you go down to point B, you're going to sure enough find out that a billion electrons is going to be flying by in a single second there as well. Uh, because anything other than that would mean that electrons are actually, well, electrons would actually be going the other way, so sorry about that, but the positive charges. Uh, because any other result would actually mean like uh, charges are falling out the side of the wire or something. If you don't have an alternate path, for the current to go down, then whatever current goes in one part of the wire continues to go in that same, uh, or go that same amount in any other part of the same wire. Like I said, until that wire breaks off and gives it choices. If the, if the wire actually runs into what we call a junction, then that's a place where two or more wire, or excuse me, it should be, yeah, two or more wires meet there, uh, more specifically, more than two, because I, uh, I don't think people, well, people might actually think of a bent wire as the same thing, but I'm trying to separate that out. So if you have like one wire coming in and then two wires leaving where the, where the one wire came in, then that means two are leaving and one's coming in. That's what I was shoot for. Now, when you have that, the total number of charge that comes in that one wire has to be equal to the total charge that went in one of the wires plus the charge that went in the other wire. So that's a conservation of charge thing. In this case, we don't have any kind of Ys or anything like that in our junctions. So yeah, the current has to be the same both at A and B. Thank you for that, Tanika. Anybody uh, 
recall when exactly is the voltage unable to be changed? There's, is there something about a circuit that you can do to make sure two different things have the exact same voltage? A parallel circuit. Exactly. So, yeah, in, in series, which is what we're seeing here, the current is always the same, and the voltages add up to give you the total voltage. In parallel, the voltages are all the same, as Tanika said there, and the currents add up to give you the total current. So good job there. All right. So what we're going to say now for part B is that... the current at A is the same as the current at B because charges had no alternative paths okay i think that's a pretty good explanation uh probably a little better than the long wordy one i gave <laughs> so we'll go with that let's look at the next example anybody have any questions on this one before we move along i'm glad to see people are understanding our electronics a little bit better uh, it's weird when you have a class like this uh you'll usually have one to Four people out of 24 will actually be quite proficient at electronics. Everybody else be like, I've never seen this crap in my life. Well, I was one of those people. I had never seen this crap in my life when I took my first physics class. So uh, never mind the grammatical underlines and stuff in this. It says, you are trying to set up your home stereo system and your speakers have a 30.0 volt supply. And the manual suggests you should not let less than 27.0 volts reach the speakers. A, assuming the speaker wires have to be copper and must be 25 meters long, what resistance should a speaker wire have to maintain at least 27.0 volts? And then B, what diameter of copper wire must be used to reach the resistance found in part A? Okay. So here we are again, solution. What I'm gonna tell you is we're clearly gonna have to figure out uh, what kind of resistances uh, could actually take and break a voltage down from 30 volts to 27 volts. So that's gonna require us to know V equals IR, which is Ohm's law. Uh, once we have that, we can actually figure out the resistance. Then we're going to need to know how do we calculate the actual resistance of a piece of wire. Well, that formula is R is equal to rho L over A. And they said we're supposed to use copper. So I happen to know that rho for copper is actually equal to 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 ohms times meters so we know that as well i also know that the area of a wire is basically a circular area so when you're talking about area like cross-sectional area it's pi r squared r since they asked for diameter here i'm going to say area is equal to just for completeness i'm going to say pi r squared but really what I'm going to use is pi d squared over 4. Because uh, if you took d over 2, that would be the radius. And then if you multiplied that by d over 2, that would be the radius as well. So d over 2 times d over 2 is d squared over 4. And evidently that's the same thing as r squared. So hopefully that helps you uh, see why I did what I did. All right, so let's start off with part A. And with that one, we want uh, V to be 30.0 volts minus 27.0 volts, which equals 3.0 volts. So that's what we want our voltage to be. 
Uh, and since we need a resistance that is going to not knock our current down, but for so much, or knock our voltage down, but for so much, we have to figure out what resistance can actually get this down to, uh, say, three volts. So if I put 3.0 volts on this side, and I put I over here and R over here, can I figure out how much resistance it would actually be? Well, uh, that's a bit of a problem because really what we have is 30 volts initially and then 3 volts breaking down, but we need to actually know what resistance we could actually have to have it be a total resistance of, 25, of 27 volts. So, or actually, I just made a whole hodgepodge of words there. I felt myself saying uh, current when I meant voltage and resistance when I meant current and all sorts of stuff. So I don't know what came out of my mouth. But right now, we can't tell too much about this because we don't know IRR. But uh, let's see. If I knew or... So what we know is if it was 30 volts initially, oh, no, sorry. We know that if it was 30 volts initially, uh, when it runs through the resistance R, the voltage at the end is going to be 27. So that's sort of what we're looking at. I, I would normally draw it with my little system of bubbles and my little system of bubbles would say, okay, here's my wire. Yeah, yeah, like that. And then this end, we have a voltage V equals 30 volts. Uh, that is not the prettiest. In fact, it felt a little squidwardy. I don't know why I said squidwardy, but it, I think it was the three looked like squidward. So 30 volts right here. Now, when we get over to this side, we're wanting 27 volts to be the bubble. So... Uh, what we need to figure out is what's going to actually reduce the voltage by 10%. So uh, delta V over V, oops, delta V over V needs to be 0 0.10 like that. That'll make it 10% because then 10% of 30 is 3. And when you should take, take away 3 from 30, you get 27. So we need our change in voltage to be that. Uh, in both cases, I assume we're going to use the same I, so that should mean that I R over I with a different R. Yeah, I think I, well, I can see the le reasoning behind there. So what we're going to do, and, and actually I, I might be have made a mistake, but what we're going to do is we're going to say that I, I think the actual resistance R must be equal to 0 0.10 ohms, okay? I know that's what I intended to do, but I think I might have left out a, out a number on here when I was typing it up earlier today. Uh, I, I did like a lot of them at one time, so there's a high chance. I made a mistake, even though I sort of went through them twice. But anyways, I know for a fact that's what the resistance is supposed to be. So we'll start from there and ignore part A, for instance. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, like I said, I was trying to make a little different problem. And I ended up leaving something out that made it impossible. So what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, part B says what diameter of copper wire must be used to reach a resistance found in part A. I'm saying I know the part A was supposed to be 0.10 ohms. So that's what we're going to use. All right. So what I have is R is equal to rho L over A. And R, of course, is 0 0.10 ohms. Now the row, like I said, is 1.68 times 10 to the negative eight uh, ohms times meters. And then it's times L, which we found already has to be 25.0 meters long. So 25.0 meters is the length. And now down here in the bottom, what I'm gonna put for the area 
is uh, basically pi over 4, but pi over 4 becomes 4 in the numerator and pi in the denominator and d squared right here. Okay, so that's pi d squared over 4 is what I just substituted for the uh, actual area. Now what I can do is multiply both sides by d squared. Or whatever you do to one side, you must do to the other, except you're not allowed to multiply through by or divide through by zero. Okay, so right now I got that. And now the other thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 0 0.10 ohms. Like so. Now that I've done that, I can see that the left-hand side is going to become d squared. And the right-hand side is going to become 4 times 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 ohms times meters times 25.0 meters divided by 0 0.10 times pi. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then take the square root later. So I want to do this math. This will be 4 times 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 times 25. And then I'm going to divide that by, here's where you use parentheses. Remember, uh, your, uh, your calculator knows your order of operations probably a little more, uh, a little better than you do. So 0.1 times 3.14159, which is plenty of digits. Close parentheses. Now that I've got that, I got the answer is 0 0.00. All the crap, that's a lot of zeros. Uh, there's five zeros here. I don't know why I didn't just write it in scientific notation, but here we are. And I'm going to call this 4, 8. Okay, so I've got more than enough digits there. We only had three. I'm giving it four now. So that's plenty. And this unit turns out to be meters squared, like that. So D is the square root of 5.348 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 meters squared, like that. So I'll take shift. Oops. I will take. This of the answer shift, and this gives me zero point zero two three one two meters, which is two point three one two millimeters. And again, we only had three sig figs, so I have to underline that last one. So, evidently, this uh speaker wire needs to be greater than or equal to 2.31 millimeters. So the wire must have a diameter of 2.31 millimeters or higher. Now, technically speaking, uh, since we actually rounded that down from uh, 2.312, I guess it'd probably be safer to shoot for something that's 2.32 or larger. Uh, but that's the kind of practical stuff that you just look into. Uh, and also, it's, it's very unlikely that anything's ever going to have exactly the reading they said. So just look, I'll say uh, suggest the speaker is going to supply 30 volts. There's no reason to believe it's actually going to be 30 volts. It's probably somewhere between, you know, 29.1 and 30.8 or something. So anyways, uh, anybody have any questions on that? Sorry about the part A. I tried to make it a little better. Your book does a problem just like this, only just blatantly tell you, hey, keep the current down below or excuse me, keep the resistance down below 0 0.10 ohms or something like that. Uh, I tried to soup it up a little bit, and I evidently forgot to write one of the numbers in there, so this this one's crap. So uh, you can just sort of read it as if it's only the, the second part, uh, and the second part says uh, reach the resistance of 
0 0.10 ohms, and then you just take out this part where it says what resistance should the speaker. Yeah, so that's how I corrected that. Anybody have any questions before we move on? All right, got another one going. So a certain piece of wire has a resistance R and the owner wishes to increase it, increase its resistance by a factor of three. The owner wants to triple the resistance because I'd really would have rather said the, the word triple, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew exactly what I meant. Triple's not too hard, but I do occasionally find people that don't know triple. Uh, quadruple and quintuple definitely is, is a problem that people forget. So be advised if you hear quadruple or quintuple, quadruple means four times, quintuple means five times. You could even do sectuple and stuff like that. But uh, we normally just call them n-tuples in the weird math world that I'm sort of in sometimes. So a certain piece of wire has a resistance R and the owner wishes to increase its resistance by a factor of three by stretching it until it is three times longer than it was. Assuming the density and mass of the wire cannot change, what will the new resistance be? So what we're talking about here is a little confusing. I, I would not be surprised to find that you don't necessarily understand uh, what we're actually shooting for. So let me explain it so that you'll at least know what it is from here on out. What we know is the formula for resistance is R is equal to rho L over A. And that means R and A, R, L, are thumbs up, thumbs up. That means R and A are thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, so because of that, this person's thinking, hey, I know the longer the wire, the more resistance. So if I take this wire and stretch it, then its length is going to get longer and I can stretch it from, let's say, three meters to nine meters or something like that. And that should work. Well, they think to themselves, well, maybe it'll get a little thinner, but that's only going to help me. So it shouldn't be a problem, right? So in the end, what we'd like to figure out is what is actually going to happen. Uh, what we do know is they're telling us that the mass and the density can't change. And if you remember, density rho is equal to mass over volume. I know I, I was a grade school teacher told me one time that uh, kids have a hard time remembering density equals mass over volume. So I'll just remind you all of the heart that they told me about, which is if you put a line through a heart, that makes uh, mass over volume. So anyways, that's a, that's a neat little sidebar. But what they're saying is the mass and the density can't change, so the volume has to stay the same. That's sort of reasonable, right? The volume is sort of reminiscent of how much material there are, is. This is actually a solid. It's not like it's a liquid, so it's a solid. So you're thinking, you know, no part's going to just break off. I'm not going to, you know, uh, cut off a part. I'm not going to add more to it. So that's what we're going to do here. What we know is R, the resistance they gave us, is equal to rho times L0 over A. And we'll call that A0. And uh, actually, to make this stand out as a different symbol, I'm going to call that R0. And we'll do like that. And uh, the rho is a property of the material, so that can't change. So I'm not subscripting the rho. I'm just going to subscript the L0 and the A because I know that when I take a wire that looks like this, like this and has a length L0 and an area A0 and now I stretch it to be a length of 3 L0 When this becomes 3L0 is equal to L, 
then there's no way that happened unless this uh, tube got a lot narrower. So we're going to imagine it now that maybe it's only this big around. And this would be the new A, like that. But what we know is V0 is equal to V final. And the V, of course, the V0 is A0 times L0. And the new volume is A times L. So if I replace the L with 3L0, what I get is A0, L0 is equal to A times 3L0. And you can see that the L0 cancels out on both sides. And now you can see that the area A is equal to A0 over 3. So by increasing the length by a factor of 3, you had to throttle down uh, the actual cross-sectional area by a factor of three as well. So we now know A is equal to A0 over three. So this means we can go back up here and say that the new R is going to be rho L over A. We already figured out that the L is 3L0. And we just figured out that the A is going to be A0 over 3. Of course, dividing a fraction uh, by a fraction means multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction. So the A0 of the, over 3 in the bottom is going to be turned over. And that 3 is going to be multiplied by the 3 to get a 9. So now I'm getting 9L0 over, or excuse me, 9 rho L0 over A0. So now you see that that is nine times the original resistance R0. So now the resistance oh, is nine times the original resistance. Now, in practice, it probably wouldn't work out exactly like that. We could actually cause the density to change a little bit. Uh, but in general, it's got to be roughly close to that. So anybody have any questions on that one? All right, I think I have another one that I wanted to do. Yeah, so platinum is used to determine temperatures of various areas or items in electrical appliances and devices. In one such device, the platinum wire has a resistance of 130 or 173.8 ohms in a 20.0 Celsius a degree Celsius environment. However, later the platinum's wire resistance climbs to 198.1 ohms. What is the new temperature of the wire? So, uh, of course, we're going to need some information about this. Specifically, we're going to need uh, the coefficient of resistivity for uh, platinum, but we'll, we'll work through that. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say solution. I don't think I recall the platinum one off the top of my head. But anyways, what we have is T0 is equal to 20.0 degrees Celsius. T, the final one, is equal to question mark. We don't know what that is, and that's what we want to know. But I do know that R0, notice this is measured in ohms, not ohm meters. So it's R0, not rho. But R0 is equal to 173.8 ohms and then the r at t which normally we just write that as r but i'm writing it at r at t just to make sure we know what we're talking about this one's 198.1 ohms like that and we need to know alpha of platinum
So I'll just call that PL right now. Uh, actually, I might have that. Let's see. Yeah, I think I have a table around here real quick. That's not it. That's not it. Almost there. Hold on, everybody. Hold on, everybody. Unless you come up with it yourself. That would be great. Ah, nope. That's the resistor code. That won't help me any. Ah, there it is. Okay, so the temperature coefficient of resistivity uh, for platinum is 0 0.003927. 0 0.003 Zero point zero zero three nine. Make sure I'm not dyslexic on that. Two seven, and that of course has reciprocal Celsius degree for the unit. Okay. Now the other thing we need to know is uh, this. It turns out that the row at a temperature T is equal to the row at temperature zero, uh, T zero say, times one plus alpha. T minus T zero. That's the formula. Now, if you take and multiply both sides of this equation by L over A, then what you get is rho T L over A is equal to rho zero L over A times one plus alpha T minus T zero like that. But now we know exactly what this is. This is RT and this is R zero. So we now have a new equation. R at T is equal to R at some T zero times 1 plus alpha t minus t0 like that. So that's what we're going to use. So let's go ahead and start putting these numbers in and solve. So what I'm going to get for this is I know the temperature at t is 198.1 ohm. That's equal to the temperature at t0 and our T0 is to 20 degrees Celsius. So that one's 173.8 ohms. And then all of that is multiplied by 1 plus alpha. Now alpha is 0 0.003927 Celsius degrees to the negative 1 power uh, times... Now what we have is the final temperature, T, which we don't know, minus the other temperature, which is 20.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, now one thing I want you to know is if you look up, for instance, alpha, you'll see that it's uh, listed as, uh, you know, alpha in this case actually is listed as Celsius degrees inverted, but sometimes they'll show it as, Kel as just Kelvin to the negative one power. Since we're actually doing a subtraction of temperatures, uh, a difference of two temperatures in Kelvin is the exact same number as a difference of the same two temperatures if they're measured in Kelvin, or excuse me, in Celsius. So for instance, 20 degrees Celsius is 293 Kelvin and zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. If you take 293 minus 273, you get 20. If you take 20 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius, you get 20. <laughs> okay, so just keep that in mind. You don't have to switch uh, between Celsius and Kelvin if you're, you're doing a difference of temperatures. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 173.8. That's a way to do it. That's the way I'm planning on doing it instead of distributing all that junk. Okay. So now that I do that, I take 198. 0.1 divided by 173.8 that gives me 1.139 so 1.139 whoa I said I just wrote a 5 and said 9 
nine, eight. Now we had four numbers before one, two, three, four. Now we only have five. So I'm going to say eight, two. That gives me two extra sig figs. Notice it's an ohm divided by an ohm, so it has no numerical value or no unit value. It's a non-denominate number. Uh, the one now, since we pulled out the multiplier from in front of the brackets, the square brackets, the square brackets don't require anything. I just write the number straight where, I, where it is. There's no distribution because I'd only be distributing one. So in this case, I'm going to get one plus... 0 0.003927 Celsius degrees to the negative 1 power times T. Now, that also has to multiply times negative 20. So I'm going to say 0 0.003927 times 20 gives me 0 0.0785. 4 and that's a zero after that so in this case the degree celsius in the bottom times the celsius uh degree celsius in the top canceled each other out and gave us just a basically a non-unit number so a non-denominate number as well so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to subtract one from both sides and i'm going to add To, to both sides, add 0 0.078540 to both sides. When I do this, I'm going to get 1.139.82 minus 1, and then I'm going to say plus 0 0.07, oops, 0 0.078540. Oh. And that gives me 0 0.21836 on the left hand side is equal to 0 0.003927 Celsius degrees to the negative one power times T. So I can divide both sides by 0 0.003 dot 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 divided by 0 0.003 dot dot dot. Too much stuff to write. <laughs> and T is going to equal. Fifty five. Point six zero five. Uh, that's in degrees Celsius, the new temperature. Now, of course, we had four sig figs, and over here we only had three sig figs, so we probably should have had three sig figs on all this, uh, which means that zero and that five are not there. It might even be a difference of the 0.6 uh, not being significant either. But anyways, that's good enough. We've worked. Actually, I think I worked. Uh, nope, I worked almost all of them. Oh, this one's so easy. Let me show you real quick what it is. <laughs> what is the resistance of a 60-watt light bulb designed to be used with a 12-volt car battery? Well, P is equal to IV is equal to I squared R is equal to V squared over R uh, is good. And in this case, we only know the P and the R, and we want to know, uh, or excuse me, the P and the uh, v and we want to know the actual r so i'm going to use p equals i squared r that gives me that gives me 60 watts is equal to uh nope not i squared i want v squared over r is equal to 12 volts squared over r sorry about that this one's P equals V squared over R. That's the one I'm actually using. So R is going to be 144 divided by 60, which I think was three points, uh, 2.4. So that's how that one's done, and we got it finished. You guys are free to go. 
It is now 639, so a little bit early still. Uh, I wait for the last person to leave. Make sure you chat me your first and last name if you haven't already done so. And I'll wait for the last person to leave in case anybody has any questions. But I also want to remind you to keep an eye out for me posting more videos. Uh, I'm going to finish off Chapter 25 uh, sometime today, tomorrow, or the next day. So uh, that's going to be the rest of it. But like I said, y'all can ask me questions at our next meeting on Thursday. So have a good evening. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. You too, Carter. Have a good one. <clears throat> Hang, that was it.